Hello and welcome to another episode of Deprogrammed. I'm very excited about my guest today. I've been able to talk to her a couple times recently, and this will be her first time appearing on my new channel. Uh, Megan Murphy is a Canadian writer. She's the founder of Feminist Current, and she's currently the host of The Same Drugs. She's also exiled in Mexico, exiled from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Megan Murphy. Hi, Megan. Hello from exile. <laughs> right, you're one of the few permanent banned people I know who hasn't gotten their account back because a lot of people got theirs back recently. You know, and I, I mean, I've appealed the ban many times over the years since I was banned at the end of 2018. And I appealed again twice since the news came out that Elon Musk was uh, yeah. planning to buy Twitter. It still hasn't gone through yet, of course. Um, and yeah, like a ton of people's accounts were restored apparently. And they never even, like, I didn't even get like, I got no response from them for either of those two appeals. I didn't get wow. a yes. I didn't get a no. I didn't get like a form response. <laughs> it's like, you, they're so stubborn with me. So stubborn. Yeah. You really pissed off the social media gods at Twitter. Can oh, you, yeah. for anyone who may not be familiar with you, um, well, let's start. Actually, let's start with how you describe yourself. Or do you still describe yourself as a feminist? You're the founder of Feminist Current. I don't describe myself as a feminist. Um, and that's not because I'm not a feminist. I mean, like, I prefer, and maybe this makes me stubborn too, but I feel that it works better for what I'm trying to do out in the world and for me as like a thinker and a writer. You know, like, I feel like my work speaks for itself and what I do and say speaks for itself. So I obviously continue to advocate for women's rights and have for a very long time. Um, but I don't describe myself as anything beyond a writer, usually. Um, I mean, I, I spend a lot of my time doing interviews for the two podcasts that I'm doing now at Feminist Current and The Same Drugs. Um, but I don't want to label myself in any political way. I want to describe the things that I believe in and what I support and what I don't support and talk about <clears throat> ideas and talk about what I think. And, you know, my ideas and the things that I think change mm -hmm. as I learn new things and gain new information and am exposed to different ideas and people who think different ways than I do and people who've had different experiences. So I don't really think that it's useful for me or for anyone else, really, to attach yourself very rigidly to any label. Yeah. You are, you've uh, been an organizer of an event coming up in Austin on Friday, June 10th, that I'm going to be on a panel with you, uh, Michelle Evans. Um, uh, who else is there? Posey Parker. Mary Lou Singleton, Mary Lou Singleton. Um, and moderated by Isabella Malbin, who's wonderful and runs um, a channel called Whose Body Is It? So anybody who's interested, who's in Texas and wants to come to this event, we're going to have a link to tickets in the show description. You can just look below and find that. But the, the title of the event is Women Leaving the Left. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means to you? Have you, were you ever... Did you consider yourself part of the left? I know there's a lot of haters on Twitter who are saying, none of these women were even in the left, <laughs> which is not true. So tell me your story about that. People love to say that. And it's hilarious to me how proud people are of their ignorance and how certain they are of what they know when they know nothing at all. Um, because I think it's easier to say, well, if you're not on the left, you never were, which doesn't make any sense because people can change their minds about things. People leave cults yeah. also. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, if you left the cult, you were never really in the right. cult. <laughs> exactly. Okay. You were never a true <laughs> believer. I guess so. I they say this about so detransitioners. They're like they, they they say this about anybody who detransitions. They say, well, you were never trans. You were not a real trans yeah. person. Yeah, totally. Yeah. These culty people, man. Um, I mean, I was like not only on the left for my entire life, like for as long as I knew what the left was and what politics were and who we voted for in my family and like the fact that we supported unions and the labor movement. But I was like the most left, like out of everyone that I knew that I went to school with in Vancouver, I grew up in a 
in a pretty middle class neighborhood and went to a pretty middle class high school. Um, I lived in in housing co-ops and my my family was working class. Um, we were fine. We weren't living in poverty. Um, we lived in a in a co-op and co-ops are not you know ghettos in Vancouver, um, but it is government subsidized housing and we didn't own property or have a nice car and we couldn't afford to go on vacations. We didn't have summer properties, obviously. We didn't even have like a home property. Um, you know, we didn't have savings. Like, so we were different than a lot of my classmates. Um, and we were, yeah, we were proudly working class. Like we were politicized about our working classness. And my dad worked for the post office for many years while I was growing up until he went back to school when I was about 13 years old. Um, and he was a shop steward. So he was really involved in the union. And I would go to union meetings with him when I was a kid because my mom would be at work. So um, she worked, she worked days and he worked nights. So we would be with my dad mostly in the daytime until she came home and then he would leave for work. Um, and, you know, I would go on, I went to like, strikes with my dad <laughs> and stood next to like union signs and we voted for the NDP in every provincial and federal election um, which is our our leftist party in Canada like similar to maybe the Labour Party in the UK there's nothing comparable in the US because the Democrats are more comparable to the Liberal Party which is our centrist party and the Democrats are probably even right of the Liberal Party um, so the end of NDP is, is pretty left wing and it used to be a socialist party. They dropped the word socialist from their constitution, I think in 2016 or something around there. And I remember just being like, how pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> like, Cause you they aren't the real course. left anymore. <laughs> right. And you, and you described yourself as a socialist back then. Yeah. I mean, I described myself as a socialist until probably a few years ago. Um, and even when I was an, an older teenager and a young adult, I went through phases of describing myself as a Marxist or an anarchist or something like that, but settled into um, socialism because it just seemed, it seemed more realistic than identifying as like a Marxist or a communist. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I I just, nobody was left enough for me. And once I started writing about feminism in 2010, um, a lot of my criticisms of other feminists were that they weren't really left wing. Like I described them as liberals. I thought the word liberal was a bad thing mm. for whatever reason. Um, and, or neoliberals, um, or it was like they were fake leftists, yada, yada, yada. They, like weren't, I, they weren't pure. No, no, they weren't pure like me. I mean, I really hated capitalism and capitalists and money. And I thought that it was wrong to own property. Um, I thought that people who were landlords were immoral. I thought that rich people were immoral. Um, it does, you know, when I talk about it now, it does sound a lot like a religion. But I was, I've of course been atheist my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like a confusing realization to come to. Yeah. And it's very familiar to me looking back on, I most often call what I was in, I, I never called myself a socialist, but you know, I was social justice. And that looking back on it definitely strikes me as a religion in that whole purity spiral thing that happens of who's more pure, which is what the people are saying about you now. Yeah. Well, she's not a pure leftist if she's, le if she's leaving, you know, she was never, never on the left. So what, what started for you this uh, change in how you looked at the world or, or described yourself, looked at yourself in relation to the world? When did that start? Um, there was a lot of things that I think were happening around the same time. Um, I was being, you know, publicly slandered and vilified and, ostracized because I had begun speaking out against gender identity legislation and, and gender identity ideology back in around 2015, probably. Um, and I testified against Bill C C-16, which is 
uh, which became Canada's gender identity legislation um, in 2017. And the people who were attacking me and saying horrible things about me and who were ostracizing me from social circles and political circles um, and refusing to publish me, refusing to interview me in the media, despite, you know, discussing me in the media. Like I remember there was a panel on the CBC discussing me in an, an event I was speaking wow. at, like debating whether or not I was, what I was saying constituted hate speech, but they didn't invite me on to discuss wow. with them as part of this panel. And I've been on the CBC before, like they know how to reach me. <laughs> Yeah. And I published articles for the CBC before. But, you know, so the way that I was being treated by the left had a lot to do with it. Um, and the fact that these people were advocating for an ideology and for policies that were not only totally nonsensical and irrational, but and irrational, but potentially harmful to women and girls, I thought. And of course, that came to fruition, these policies have been harmful to women and girls and continue to be. Um, also, and I was being censored, right? And I was like, oh, free speech, right, got it. <laughs> and it's not, I had never necessarily opposed free speech, but I had never actively supported free speech. I never really thought about it that much. It just wasn't something that was an important concept to me, probably partly because I had always felt that I had it. So I never had to worry about it. But also because I was one of those leftists, as we've seen leftists do now, who sort of considered free speech a, a dog whistle for the right or for libertarians. And at the time, I had decided that libertarians were my enemy, that the right were my enemy, that conservatives, that liberals, you know, anyone all to the right of me, um, you know, was yeah. either bad or stupid. Um, that's what I thought in any case. And <clears throat> then of course, Hillary Clinton lost the election to Trump. I cried. I was, too. I was shocked. <laughs> I'm glad I finally <laughs> talked to someone who cried. Usually when I tell people oh that God. they laugh at me, but you know what that was like. So. I cried like really hard. Like I cried, like I was like snotty and like, I couldn't breathe. Like I was just like, Cause I just, I assumed she was going to win. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I was living in Canada, so I didn't vote. Um, but I felt like really guilty that I hadn't like supported her more or done something or like tried. I, I actually am an American citizen, but I've never lived in the U S before. So I've never voted in an American election just because I wouldn't even know what state to vote for. And I don't know anything about what's going on in those states. So it just seems like a weird thing to do, I guess. Um, although I might start to try to consider that more now. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I cried and I just thought it was so unfair. And I was like, wow, America really hates women. America is really a misogynist place that's so awful to learn and realize. Um, but, you know, as things progressed, I started to be curious about why Trump had won. And I didn't want to just write everyone off as a racist or a misogynist or as anti-immigrant or, you know, white and rich, because that obviously wasn't true. Like, I was looking at the statistics around who voted for Trump. And it, that just, it, that wasn't true. Um, what people were saying about those people weren't true. I started, you know, getting to know and talking to and listening to people who voted for Trump and learning about why they voted for Trump. And, and you know, was like, this makes sense. This isn't irrational. These people aren't hateful. And it started to make me really, really angry the way that the left was framing people who had voted for Trump and, and Trump supporters. Um, and so as the next election approached, I still up until, you know, maybe like a month or two before that election took place, um, was thinking, you know, I could, I don't support the Democrats at all. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't want Biden to be president, but I also was like, couldn't bring myself, I couldn't think about bringing myself to vote for Trump. Um, and then a couple of months before I started to 
say publicly, you know, like if I was living in the US, I would vote for Trump. Not because like I'm a huge Trump fan or think he's really great or smart or anything, but I thought he would be better than Biden. And I still think he would have been better than Biden. Um, and th those are the choices that people have in elections. You don't have a perfect candidate generally. Maybe in local elections you do, but in, in federal elections um, you don't. So there was that. Uh, sorry, this is really long-winded. Oh, go ahead. Just, like, so many things. And, you know, like I started to get really frustrated within feminism and frustrated with the people, the women that I was working with and engaged with in feminism because they were so rigid in their thinking and they started to reveal themselves to me. I mean, I'm sure they'd always been like this, but I just didn't see it very, um, you know, unwilling to think critically. Like they saw themselves and defined themselves as critical thinkers, but they refused to think outside of their particular feminist leftist ideology. And I was expected to believe all women um, and expected to reject the concept of due process. Um, and I wasn't allowed to ask questions, you know? So if a man was accused of something within Me Too, um, I wasn't allowed to say, well, like, what did he do? Like, did he actually rape somebody? Is he actually an abuser? Because somebody accused him of rape or abuse, which means he's a rapist and an abuser and a bad guy. And we have to support that woman, even if it's like an anonymous woman, like even if we have no yeah. idea who this person is or where the accusations came from, we support and believe women. And I was like, I am not prepared to do this. I'm not prepared to vilify and like destroy the lives of individual men when I don't even really know what they did. Right. It's a bit like the Salem witch trials. Mm -hmm. It's just, it doesn't matter. Don't need to know the facts. Here's your pitchfork. Let's go. And it was, <laughs> that's the same thing that people were doing to me in a way, right? They were saying, mm -hmm. Megan's bad. Megan's racist. Megan's transphobic. Megan is a far right extremist. Whatever people say about anybody, whatever they were saying about me, People also weren't supposed to look into the details or ask questions about that and find out what I'm really saying. They weren't supposed to show up to my talk to hear what I had to actually say, lest they find out that I'm not a hateful bigot. They were just supposed to believe it and go along with it and condemn me. Mm -hmm. And it just it was also hypocritical. And, and these were feminists who were demanding free speech and angry that they were being censored and angry that they weren't being allowed to speak publicly against things like gender identity ideology. And yet they were okay with other people being censored and vilified and, and canceled and treated in this way, or if they were people who weren't their political allies or people who didn't agree with their politics. It's hypocritical. It's once you start to see that hypocrisy and as you put it, the rigid thinking, so much of your story reminds me of mine. There's a lot of important differences, of course, but there's so much that's in common if, of just once you start to see this and then really question, does this describe me? Am I, am I in this group with these people, with this belief system, this rigid belief system? What was some of the worst, if you wouldn't mind talking about it, what was some of the worst stuff that, that happened to you during the mobbing and stuff? Cause I saw it. I've said this before. If there's anyone new who's watching, I was one of those viewers. I'll put it that way. I read a lot of the feminist blogs I was in a lot of the feminist communities in California at the time. I was on the board of WAM, Women Action in the Media. And oh, okay. I didn't I realize knew, that. That's oh, like, yeah. I was on that listserv for many years and stopped speaking on the listserv because everybody hated me. Yeah, <laughs> and I saw it. I saw people come after you, feminists. So, so for anyone who doesn't know, these, these sort of mobbings, they just started becoming very regular, at least as I saw it, in the feminist world and all this infighting. And now it's become something we're all used to seeing because it's it's in the mainstream now these mobbings these cancellations and and tearing down someone who's who's in in the group and and you're not pure enough let's pull you down as you said they come up with reasons oh your ideas are this kind of is that kind of is you know we're not allowed to talk about these things or have different we're not have a different opinion or ask questions and so that I saw that happening to you and I was quiet I was one of the people who let fear stop me from speaking and saying anything, um, which I regret, I deeply regret, but you also, you changed, you helped to change me. You helped me change myself 
watching how um, strong you were to face all that kind of vilif vilification and then continue to say, this is what I think and be unapologetic about it. So w what was that mobbing like for you? I mean, it was just never ending. Um, I mean, it began almost right away when I started writing about feminism um, because I opposed things like prostitution and pornography. And I thought that BDSM was not something that should be promoted as like sexually empowering or sexually liberating. I thought that probably, I mean, what people do behind closed doors is none of my business. What people do in bed is totally their own business. And, you know, I don't think that your sex life should align with your politics. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that would probably be pretty <laughs> annoying, <laughs> perhaps dull. But, um, you know, I, I didn't think, like, we were seeing all these feminists, like, promoting BDSM as, like, liberating and healthy and, you know, maybe even as a way to deal with trauma. And I just, you know, and, and then there was that, that slut walk like, march. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. That was, you know embracing the term slut uh as a as a means to um uh and like victim blaming that was what they were saying um and the the marches involved these like young women marching around in their underwear and then they would have like pole dancers and and strippers and all that and i just was like what is this like this is not feminism this is stupid this is not good for women. Like, I don't think sexual objectification is good for women. And, you know, I, so I was attacked for doing all of that. Um, I feel like I was just, I was always like a bit of a pariah in the mainstream. And then of course it was once I began to be critical of the gender identity thing that the left came after me. Um, and <clears throat> in about 2015, I was working for a Canadian progressive website called rabble.ca. I was a part-time yep. editor there. Um, I, you know, was working on the uh, podcast network for a while there. I had a column there. Um, I cross posted all of my posts and podcasts from feminist current there. Um, and the people who, were engaged with my coworkers and the people who supported the site and most of the people who wrote for the site and you know the people who funded the site were all people who hated me partly because they wanted to decriminalize prostitution and I was a big advocate for the Nordic model um I didn't want a legalized prostitution industry in Canada um, and then when I started writing about the gender identity thing, so they, a, a whole bunch, like hundreds of leftists in Canada, primarily in Toronto, started a petition to have me fired um, and, you know, just said every possible thing they could about me online, that I was racist, that I was anti-immigrant, that I was transphobic, and that I was a whorephobe, <laughs> and all of these things. Wow. And it was just, it was so stressful. Like I almost had like an emotional breakdown. Um, now, since then I've been through much worse and I'm fine. Like I'm pretty used to it. Like it can be exhausting and stressful, but it doesn't bother me as much as it did then. You've been through the fire, but that yeah. was like your first big fire. Yeah. Like it just doesn't get to me that much anymore. Like I have a pretty thick skin and I'm also, I mean, I'm pretty good at, balancing my life like I'm not gonna like I don't want to spend an excessive amount of time online especially like reading toxic shit about me but um you know and my employers didn't support me and I couldn't speak out in my own defense because my employer was sort of doing like an investigation into all of my work to determine whether or not I was a bigot and a very wow old. they did a bigot investigation <laughs> <laughs> Like they've combed through every single podcast that I'd produced and every column that I'd written to see if I actually was all these things. That they were looking at the wrong thing. Was. Yeah. Wow. And they didn't find anything, but they didn't, you know, but they wouldn't, they didn't want to support me and they treated me really badly behind the scenes. You know, like all of my coworkers basically stopped speaking to me. So I didn't get fired because I hadn't done anything wrong. And this was a site that was like, 
a union site. Like this was a labor movement site. They were funded by unions and by the NDP. Um, and so, it, you know, it would be pretty, pretty weird for them to fire somebody without grounds. But yeah, like I just, I was totally ostracized and it was really painful because those, some of those people were my friends. Um, and a lot of the people who were saying horrible things about me online had been my friends or people that I've known. And that's the worst part about all these kinds of mobbings is when you see your friends or friends of friends getting involved and they, they go along with it or they disown you because they don't want to be canceled themselves, you know, canceled by association as it did, were. Did you have any of those people, the kind who will privately support you or send you messages of support, but then publicly not come to your defense? That's one of the worst, I think. Yeah, yeah, all the time. I mean, most of my friends did that. Some of my friends um, would tell me that, like, they couldn't like my posts on social media, but that they supported me. Um, some of them would say, I can't invite you to, like, my birthday because so-and-so's coming and they don't like you. And these are all people that I don't know. I'm like, they don't like me, huh? Like, I've never met this person. I have no idea who this person is. These people are so full of themselves. Like, they really think that they matter. Like, it's like, why does what you think about me matter? You're nobody. Like, who the fuck are you? You know nothing mm -hmm. about me. You've never met me before in your life. And you're like, I don't like Megan Murphy. That makes me... <laughs> yeah. Right. I'm like, who gives a fuck? Like, <laughs> but like, so that I, lo I love that. I love that attitude. It's that <laughs> self importance and that, uh, yeah. but yeah, that kind of cowardly, I think it's almost, it's a painful blessing in disguise. I've learned yeah. that a lot of blessings, not all of them, but a lot of them are disguised in ways that they're painful at first. And then later I've looked back on them, back on them and said, well, I'm glad because I learned this about this person or, you know, you learn about people's character. Yeah. And so that was happening to you for any, anybody, any, any American who's not familiar with bill C-16. So you testified against it around this time. Can you tell them, and Jordan Peterson testified against it. Can you tell them what B bill C-16 was or is? Um I mean, it was to add gender identity and expression to the human rights code and the criminal code. Um, and it was actually, it was very vague. Like it didn't say specifically what it would do in terms of law. It wasn't like it explicitly said, now men are allowed to access women's change rooms if they identify as women. Um, or now we are going to start transferring men who identify as women to female prisons. Um, but I suspected that's the kind of thing that would happen um, because, you know, if we're protecting gender identity as a concept in the human rights code, I didn't see how we could also protect women's sex-based rights. Um, you can't say, you know, we need to protect women because they experience a particular kind of oppression as females because they're born female in this world um, and also say, there's no such thing as a woman and we can't define a woman and maybe a man's a woman. <laughs> like yeah. who are we protecting in that case? Um, and I also at the time expressed concerns. I felt that the idea of gender identity was sexist because it was saying things like if a boy likes to wear dresses or likes the color pink or likes to play with dolls more than he likes to play with trucks, maybe that makes him a girl. And if a girl you know, it likes to roughhouse and, you know, play in the dirt or play like, you know, sports typically reserved for, for boys and young men. Um, she likes to keep her hair short. She doesn't like girly things. Like maybe that makes her a boy. And I knew that in feminism for decades, we'd fought against those ideas. You know, that was the way that I was raised. I could be and do whatever I wanted to do. And when I was a kid, I was quite tomboyish and I didn't like girly things and I wanted to play with the boys and I wanted to, you know, I hated the color pink and, you know, I liked tomboys, like the, the little girls in the books that I like to read were tomboys, like Pippi Longstocking. They were like tough, strong, independent girls. And now I feel like we've moved backwards so much. Um, you know, maybe Pippi is like a trans boy. Maybe I was a trans boy. 
And I just, yeah, I thought these ideas were so anti-feminist and so sexist and so aggressive. And yet progressives were the ones who were advocating these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So do you see uh, a future for feminism? You don't describe yourself as a feminist anymore. Do you think, what do you think is going to happen to the movement? Oh, goodness. I mean, I think that if there ever is going to be any real feminist movement, you know, that essentially just advocates for women's rights and isn't caught up in all this ideological, theoretical, academic stuff um, and essentially nonsense. Like if we're going to have a movement that is fighting against actual violence against women, female genital mutilation, like the actual you know, prostitution, trafficking, um, fighting for women who actually don't have rights and can't operate autonomously and independently in other countries. I don't think it's going to be anything like the feminism that we see today. And I think that it'll be driven by women across the political spectrum because there are lots of right-wing women who think that FGM and prostitution are wrong and that women in Saudi Arabia shouldn't have to cover their faces or, you know, not be allowed to drive and who think that girls should be allowed to have access to education and not be kept out of high school. Um, and that gender identity is a wrong sexist idea that's dangerous to women and girls. Um, I don't think that it's productive to do feminism the way that we've been doing it for the past few decades and the way that I was doing it where, you know, there was just this list of things you had to believe and do and be in order to count as a real feminist. Um, like you had to be a leftist, you had to be a socialist, you had to be anti-capitalist, you had to be intersectional. Um, you had to, you know, agree with all of these various policies um, and ideologies and practices, and you had to go along with all these mantras, unquestioningly believe women, um, for example. And I think that alienates women. And mm -hmm. so I think that it's much harder to get things done. You know, um, I think that it, it isolates us and, and prevents us, yeah, from having from having real influence. Like if, if we want to have real influence, we have to talk to people who are not like us and get to know people who aren't like us and talk to any politician that will listen. I mean, why yeah. would we limit ourselves to only talking to left-wing politicians who hate us and don't want to listen to us anyways and are calling us bigots, you know? Like the people that I had been voting for for my whole life were trashing me publicly. Yeah. Like... I'm going to keep voting for these people and keep struggling to get them to like me and listen to me. No, like it's an insult to me. Mm -hmm. Like these people should have some self-respect. Yeah. Do you, do you think labels are responsible for the, this tribalism, this kind of echo chamber thing that happens where it becomes, as you described it, like a religion. And I've, I've called it cult like in the past it, 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 is the problem is the problem labels? I mean, labels help us to organize information and it's like a shortcut of being able, a shorthand of being able to understand something about a person when they say, I am this or this or this. But is there also this bad side to putting labels on everything where then you're kind of expected to ad adopt all these different things under the banner of this one label? I think that labels are limiting. Um, so I think it's part of the problem. And I think that it pushes people into rigid thinking and it pushes people to exclude people, you know, for a bunch of people who are always talking about inclusion and inclusivity, they're very exclusive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they like to kick people out and they like to kick like, you know, like keep people out. Um, yeah. So I do, I, I do think that these, these kinds of labels encourages that and it encourages people to limit their own thinking and engagement also because it's like well you're a feminist so you can't think this or you can't read this or you can't engage with this kind of person or you can't take this kind of person seriously like if you're a feminist you can't speak to a man who's critical of feminism unless you're there to like attack him and try to make him look stupid 
Um, yeah. You can't actually listen to what he really feels and thinks about these ideas and take him seriously and treat him with respect. Um, you can't be pro-life. That was a big one. I remember. Yeah. You they can't were be pro-life. And I was like, dude, like I know feminists who are pro-life. You just don't know who they are because they don't tell you that they're pro-life because you know that you'll, they'll, you'll like attack them um, or because you refuse to speak to them. But like you're rejecting a lot of women and I'm pro-choice. Like I disagree with pro-life arguments and ideologies and what that does to women and women's autonomy. But it doesn't mean that I'm not going to engage with or respect or take seriously or work with women who have different beliefs than I in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell people a little bit about speaking of that you've got, you've brought together this very diverse group of women for the panel in Austin on uh, June 10th. Can you tell people a little about what the panel is about and the, the, conversation that you hope to inspire? Yeah, I mean, I I was just hearing from and seeing so women, so many women say and talking to so women, many women who were feeling politically homeless, um, you know, had who had been on the left for much of their life and no longer wanted to be on the left because of what they saw the left doing and saying. Um, or they had been totally alienated and ostracized and vilified by these people um, and, you know, kicked out of their political parties or social groups or activist groups. And, and also women that were starting to question the various party lines, whether that be around gender identity or, you know, COVID, like, you know, essentially, if you were left wing in the past two years or progressive in the past two years, you had to support all of the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates and the removal of people's civil rights and liberties. And I didn't agree with any of that at all. And so I was accused of being right wing for that. And I was like, OK, then fine, whatever. You can call me whatever you want, but I support Canadians constitutional rights. And that, I, okay, that makes me right wing. That, what does that make the left? Like fascist, totalitarians? Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this gets to the heart of what you're saying about the labels being limiting because in this place that we find ourselves right now, I find I have to ask people what they mean now when they say liberal mm -hmm. or conservative or just because ever, they've got different definitions now. There's a lot of people who are calling themselves liberals, but who support author these authoritarian policies because the tribe did, because the tribe adopted it. This is our position. Well, it's a liberal. Doesn't matter. It's the liberal position now. And yeah. uh, so so that's that's gotten very confusing. And, and you're right. There are so many people. I myself, I'm in a similar place. I don't really know what to call myself. I'm, I try to hang on to the liberal label because... Well, for one thing, I don't I don't think if you leave if you leave leftism or social justice, what have you, it they like the people on the left like to think it's just this binary of you're either a leftist or you're this Nazi bigot, right? Or you know, the right wing or whatever. And and I I want to create a space for people on the left to realize because they're so tied to their um identity as being liberal, and and I'm I wonder if you were as well tied to that identity of being on the left, that there's space for you to still be a liberal and to be a true liberal and to support individual liberty and civil rights and bodily autonomy and um, non-aggression principle and all these things. You can still be a liberal and not be a leftist. Do you have, do you, do you think about words as I, I can tell you do because you're no longer describing yourself as a feminist. Are there any words that you want to reclaim? Um, I mean, I used to put a lot of time and energy into trying to reclaim feminism, but I gave that up because I think it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, I think feminism means so many different things to so many different people, and it's attached to so many ideologies and mantras and politics that I don't agree with um, that I don't care. I'd rather talk about women's rights or, again, talk about specifics, like specific things that I believe or that I'm advocating for. Um, and I mean, 
in terms of, I've never really identified as a liberal before, so I don't feel necessarily attached to that word. I mean, maybe that would be the word that would best describe me, but I also bet there would be things in there that wouldn't quite fit. Um, what and, about left? What about being on the left? Was there any sort of sense? Eh, of I don't care. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these feminists and leftists that I, I've, I've long been engaged with, or who I was once allied with, will say like, you know, <laughs> that's not the real left. You know, when I'm criticizing the left and their their opposition to free speech and their support for gender identity ideology or their mm -hmm. support for totalitarianism or whatever, um, they'll be like, but that's not the real left. I'm like, but that's the real left now. Like. You yeah. can cling <laughs> to what once was or what you thought the left was, but this is the left today. These mm -hmm. are our left-wing groups, activists, political parties. Um, and I just, I wish that people weren't so attached to these labels and groups mm -hmm. um, and that they would just accept that it's okay to think independently and they don't really need to be part of a political tribe. I know that it's sort of human nature to want to be part of a tribe um, and that people obviously feel more comfortable and safer functioning in that way. Um, and that it can be kind of scary to be out there on your own as it were, but you aren't really, I mean, there's lots of people like us, like, again, that's why I wanted to organize this panel because I know that this is what is being experienced by so many people, not just women, you know, people all across North America and even in the UK to a certain extent and in Europe in certain places. Um, and they're questioning all these narratives and they're feeling like what they supported and believed all along and the parties that they voted for all along are not working in, in their best interests or in the best interests of the people. Um, and, you know, people have over the past at least couple of years totally lost faith in the media and in, you know, public health authorities and in politicians more so than in the past. I mean, a lot of people don't trust politicians, but I think what we've seen over the past couple of years throughout this whole COVID thing has really hammered in the fact that these people are liars. And that they'll hide facts or lie about facts in order to serve their interests or the interests of industry uh, or the wealthy or whatever their narrative is, regardless of whether or not it's true and regardless of whether or not it's good for people or might hurt people. Um, and that makes people not want to engage with the left or progressives or Democrats. You know, that's happened to so many people. And if people on the left or who are feminists want to continue to deny that, I guess they can do that, but they're not operating in reality anymore. You know, the left is not, they're not doing good things. They're not creating good policy. They're not telling the truth. They're not working for you. Where do you see things heading? Do you have a positive outlook? Just culturally, uh, in in both Canada and the U.S., the West in general, where do you see all this leading or where do you think it could lead? I don't know. I mean, I'm sort of cynical, unfortunately. So <laughs> maybe the end of the world. Um, <laughs> and end video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on where you are. Um, I have hope for the U.S. I have hope for certain states in the U.S. Um, I don't have much hope for Canada. Um because I think there's just not enough pushback and I don't think there's enough distrust of the government, although it was very um, inspiring to see what the trucker convoy managed to accomplish and to see how many people really are opposed to Justin Trudeau and his liberal party now, and they see through that charade um, and they see that he's behaving like a totalitarian um, mm -hmm. and that he's taking away Canadians' rights and freedom. Um, but, you know, when I talk to people still living in Canada, to me, they don't seem angry enough. You know, they, there's too many people in Canada who are apathetic 
um, or who just want to feel safe and comfortable. Um, and they think that if they just keep going along, then the government will take care of them, despite the fact that we've seen the opposite happen over the past couple of years. You know, I when I talk to my friends living in BC, it's amazing how unaffordable everything has become. And it was already pretty bad, you know, on account of inflation. And they're still, you know, sticking it out and going along and not pushing back and not leaving. Um, I know a lot of people who have left because they've come to places like here in Mexico where I live. Um, but a lot of people in Canada are comfortable and they have decent paying jobs and they have their health care and they have their houses or their condos. Um, and they've been told over and over and over again that Canada is a good, nice, safe, progressive place to live where actually you are free, even if you're not free, even if your rights can be taken away at a moment's notice. Um, it's really, it's fine. It's really, it's fine. They're not going to put us in jail. They're not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't have much hope for Canada. Um, Is part I of mean, that cultural, like related to the history of the country versus the U.S.? This people I'm, aren't angry enough. You said. Yeah, I think that people in Canada have never really had to fight for their rights before, um, and so it's just not part of our culture. Um, we haven't really fought for free speech before. You know, we have had a pretty comfortable, good, low conflict situation in Canada. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think because people are comfortable, not that it's like, I want people to be comfortable. I want people to have like decent incomes and homes and, and comfortable lives and access to healthy food. But I also think that when you're too comfortable and you're not around people who have actually struggled, you know, you're not around actual working class people, people who've struggled through poverty, people who fled war um, or actual, you know, totalitarian dictatorships and who are political exiles or in political asylum. I think that you forget what a real struggle is and then you start inventing things or you start just going along with whatever the American narrative is, usually for Canadians. You know, I found it very amusing to watch people in Vancouver holding BLM rallies and marches because that's not, yeah, you know, there's not a, an epidemic of racist police violence and shootings in Canada. Yeah. Um, is not racism is not a massive problem in Canada. We're a very diverse, open-minded country. Um, it's not to say that racism doesn't happen or that racist people don't exist in Canada, but it's not like if you're black in Vancouver, you're being persecuted because you're yeah. black or being shot for no reason. That's just not the case. And it's like, oh, don't you guys have anything real? <laughs> To protest, <laughs> to, about. About, to protest about and these were the same people of course who wanted to shut down all the rallies for freedom um the, the chucker and, rallies yeah the the protests against the mandates and the lockdowns um because those were people who were politically wrong um but during covid it was totally fine to have like a blm rally because racism is of all the racism that's happening in vancouver one of the richest most privileged cities in the entire world well it's when the system when the machine supports the protest you gotta wonder is it really a protest I know. It's like, <laughs> like why you're on the side of like amazon and nike like fight the power yeah. <laughs> mcdonald's <laughs> They've got to yeah. float. <laughs> um, so this is a question I like to ask people from all different backgrounds who've, who've, who have either woken up to what social justice is, to what's going on around us culturally, or woken up, you know, during some of the COVID lockdown measures. Um, what is it about you, do you think, that helped you to see through some of this BS 
and to start to see things a little more clearly and more measured. Is there something, and maybe you don't know, but is there something about your, your character, your personality, your past, um, your life? Um, well, I think I've always been a bit of a contrarian, which doesn't mean that I just take positions because they're opposed to the mainstream position. But I feel that I've always been skeptical of the mainstream narrative and pretty questioning when somebody orders me to get in line. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've never um, respected authority. You know, I was the kind of kid who thought that like public schools were a bad place because, you know, I, I didn't want to follow the, the rules of these authoritarian teachers. And um, I also, you know, I think my parents were pretty, my parents were pretty controlling and pretty uptight and didn't allow me a lot of autonomy and freedom um, and didn't really let me have my own voice. And they certainly didn't recognize or re respect my voice. So I feel like my whole life I've had to fight mm. to be heard and fight to be understood and fight for what I believed was true and right. Um, you know, I feel like there was a lot of like rules that didn't make sense and were just rules for the sake of being rules and that there was hypocrisy and irrationality and, you know, this would be the rule one day, but not the next day. And you have to do it because we said so. And no, we don't have to explain why. And there's not going to be any conversation around this. Um, and I just fought and fought and fought and fought and fought back against that kind of thing from when I was a kid. Um, but I mean, I also think that some people are just born this way. Like some people have an inherent desire to fight. Like I always... I always wanted to fight for justice. However, I saw that um, when I was a kid, I was fighting, you know, sexism in the classroom and, you know, fighting against the boys who were like raiding girls' bodies. And I, I just, I've never been a rule follower. Yeah. <laughs> I've always yeah. been rebellious and, and, and I just, I don't have it in me to go along. Not, in public or in private, not in a yeah. relationship, not in politics, not in what I do. Like I can't sit down and shut up. And there's something about that. You say fighting for justice. It's, it's a, there are some people, I think I'm one of the, I can't stand, I just can't stand cheaters, unfairness, mm -hmm. liars. And I think a lot of us when we're younger, get pulled into social justice um, for for good with good intentions. I did anyway. And I know a lot of young people are today. Um, what would you say if there's anyone watching who's a, a, maybe a younger person who's getting, who's, who's started to pick up some of these social justice tenets of belief, what kind of questions would you ask them? Or maybe what advice would you have for a parent of questions they could ask their, their kid? that would get them thinking about what is real justice? Like, what does that mean? I mean, I think in general, asking questions is the best way to get people to challenge their own thinking. Um, telling people what to think or telling people that they're wrong does not tend to work. Um, yes. But asking them questions that will, you know, encourage them to look at things in a different way or to follow their thoughts all the way through to the end, you know, like, why do you think this? Like, have you had this experience? Do you know anybody like this? I, you know, people who say that like all white people are bad and racist, um, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm not racist. Is he racist? Are you racist? All these people are bad and racist. Like, let's talk this through to try to get them out of their, you know, mantras and their knee jerk positions. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, really the, the best way to change your mind and to open your mind is to listen to people who are different than you and read things 
that are written by people who see things differently than you or who are on the other end of the political spectrum to you. You know, like if you voted for Biden, like try listening to or reading articles written by people who did vote for Trump and see what they have to say. And I mean, you should treat everyone as a human, like all these people who are supposedly fighting for human rights and um, fighting for people to be treated fairly and with dignity and with respect, spend so much of their lives dehumanizing other people. Yeah. You know, they're treating more than half the population as though they're stupid or bad or evil. Um, it's so condescending. You know, I can't stand watching all these people who claim to be supporting the oppressed and marginalized speaking down to and, and condescending to poor people and working class people. Like, who is it that you're representing then? Is that a real person? Like, you know, I've, I've argued with all sorts of people about prostitution, for example, and the fact that like most women and girls don't want to be in prostitution and it's a really dangerous, abusive, exploitative, traumatic place for women and girls to be. And the people who will say, oh, well, you know, some women really like it. Like someone really enjoy it. Like it's their choice. They're making money. And it's like, do you know women who've been trafficked? Like, have you talked to women who were pushed into prostitution when they're 12 or 13 years old and like worked on the downtown East side? Because I have, like, I know those women and I've talked to those women and I've listened to those women and I've learned from their experiences. And uh, you can still, of course, like you can listen to all sorts of people and it doesn't mean you have to go along with whatever they're saying or, or assume that their experience is universal. But I think that a lot of these people are totally out of touch with the kinds of people that they believe they're advocating for. It's like, okay, well, you care about the poor and the working class. Like, why don't you go to like a poor area of the United States and like talk to those people about their politics and what they think about Joe Biden or what they think yeah. about your politics, what they think about abolishing the police, what they think about the idea that a man should be able to walk into their daughter's change room or that their daughter should have to compete against boys and on like the track team or whatever. Like all you do is you repeat your ideologies and you watch what people say on social media and that's mm -hmm. not real life. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's like a helpful answer. I feel like I just ranted, but. <laughs> no, no, I, it's good stuff. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of your echo chamber. That was one of the first things that similar to you once I was shocked when Trump won and it caused me to like some of my friends, it caused them to double down on wokeness, but it caused me to start leaving it slowly. Although I didn't realize that was hap what was happening at first, but I wanted to understand why he won. And yeah. so then it was like, okay, I need to start listening to and reading and understanding all these people I've demonized who I've never actually read their opinions. You know, <laughs> like I just know what I'm told to think of their opinions. Um, I think that's great advice, Megan. Um, so, can you just plug one more time uh, the event uh, that's happening on June 10th, let people yes. know who's going to be there and then where can people find you online? And we'll put all these links down below so you guys can grab it. Uh, so the event on June 10th is called women leaving the left. Um, it will be myself, Mary Lou Singleton, Carrie, uh, Michelle Evans and Posey Parker slash Kelly J Keene. Um, and it's happening from six to eight at the Austin public library. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but Terrazas branch. Um, I don't know either. and anyway, all this information is on the event right online, which Carrie will put below. Um, and I'm really excited about the event. Like, I don't think there's ever been an event like this before. Like, I don't think that there's been like an all woman panel, um, featuring, you know, diverse women, women who've come from across the political spectrum, um, feminists who are advocating free speech, 
Um, and I think we're going to be doing a lot of wrong thinking in various ways. You know, like I've done a lot of <laughs> talks and panels about gender identity, um, but I've not done anything public around vaccine mandates, around COVID restrictions, around free speech and civil liberties. Um, I've not been on panels where we're all likely to disagree on things in this, mm -hmm. in this way. We are. And still you know, maintain friendships and, and respect for one another and still continue to work together. Um, and I think that a lot of the conversation around free speech and civil liberties um, has been dominated by, by men. And I think that men, sexism still does exist. It's true. Um, I think that a lot of these men don't even think about us. Like I, they, I think they think they're the only ones saying this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and it's frustrating. And, and I think that a lot of men have written off feminists, and for good reasons, because feminists have not done a very good job at all of, of sticking up for free speech. <laughs> like, that's why I'm trying to do this. Um, that's why I'm, I'm talking about this event as being organized by feminists for free speech, because I'm like, you can, you know, there are people like us out there who, who support women's rights. Um, but also I love, free speech. I love your hashtag, which the haters are are currently making fun of. <laughs> F F FFS. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That was a happy coincidence. I didn't even realize at first and someone else pointed out to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you made me think of, I was going to tell you, when I first started leaving the social justice cult and I was trying to help people in my social justice world, like understand my train of thought and what was happening with me. And, um, and I created some, what I thought were some humorous groups at the time. I never did anything with them. One was called liberals for free speech. I did make t-shirts because I thought that was kind of funny. If I wore the shirt, people would be like, aren't liberals for free speech. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> right. Aren't they? Shouldn't they be? I think so. <laughs> right. And then, and then the other. You're was, like, uh, why do you need to say that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> why do I need to say it? Um, and the, the other one was, and feel free to use this one if you ever want to, because I didn't do anything with the group, but uh, it was called Feminists Against Feminism, <laughs> which I just thought was kind of funny. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> it's funny because like some people, including my boyfriend, introduced me as like a feminist who hates feminism. <laughs> I'm like that's true. Like you, you really do it. hate feminism. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, not all of feminism. Like obviously, that's a joke. But I'm like a yeah. very anti-feminist or an anti-feminism <laughs> feminist in many ways. I'm just making <laughs> a note that I might call this episode "Feminist Against Feminism" because yeah, it's funny. Perfect. I'll run it by you first. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get with you. Well, thank you so much, Megan. I'm so looking forward to see you in person. And um, yeah, I just appreciate you spending time with us. And everybody, go check out Megan's podcast, The Same Drugs. Um, if you're in Austin, come in and hang out with us on June 10th. And, um, and yeah, I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. I'm really stoked about next week. I'm looking forward to hanging with you in person as well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.